And I think it's had kind of a perverse, uh, unintended perverse effect, because I, I don't think there's any question what the intent of Congress was in 1973 when it wrote that legislation and overrode President Nixon's veto. They were trying to curtail the president's war-making authority. But in some ways, I, I think some analysts might tell you that it actually has had the opposite effect. It essentially has given a president license to go in and get us involved in some situation and there's very little likelihood that once the troops are in place, Congress is going to take a vote to, you know, tell the president to bring them home. But, I mean, that's just not going to happen. It's not realistic to think that members of Congress or very many members of Congress are going to say, no, we disapprove, you bring the troops home. Because, you know, like I was saying last time, that's, that's going to be construed as not supporting the troops, which is not politically, um, that's the kiss of death politically, right? Well, okay. So it's a short list, and you know most of the powers on this list, the president has to share with Congress. So just go back and review your notes. I think we talked about each of these and talked about how Congress has a counterbalancing power in each case. All right, so that brings us to this point here about the two theories of presidential power. Uh, I don't want to go into a lot of detail here. I'm just going to sort of give you a, a quick um, description of what each means. Because the powers delegated to the president by the Constitution are pretty limited, it has sort of led to two interpretations. The first interpretation, the literalist interpretation, says that the president has only those powers that are specifically delegated by the Constitution. This is it. One of the powers of the president, this is it. You can take a literalist interpretation of the powers of Congress, too, which would say that Congress only has the powers that are delegated by the Constitution. But this theory says that the president can only exercise the powers that are specifically delegated in the Constitution. Stewardship theory says that there are certain powers that are inherent in the office of the president by virtue of the fact that he's chief executive. While the president's not a king, certainly, like the kings of Europe, there are certain powers inherent in the office. They don't have to be specified in the Constitution. And that includes, but is not limited to war-making powers. By virtue of the fact that the president is chief executive and commander-in-chief, there are certain powers inherent. Presidents going back at least, what, 60, 70, 80 years, maybe 90 years, have operated according to which of these two theories? Clearly, presidents, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, have operated under this model. Presidents assume that they have certain powers, even if they're not specifically indicated in the Constitution. 